Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of The Farming Programme. I'm John Kenyuk, and each week at this time, we bring you topics of interest uh, from the Manx countryside, from things that go on there, the life that's going on, the people who work and live there, things of interest from the countryside, but from farming in particular. This week has seen uh, always usually a comment on the weather as we start this programme. Uh, the rain this week, of course, has been very, very welcome. Uh, rain in May, of course, is, is absolutely essential for the growth of the year and the crops that will eventually um, be the yield for the year are formed very largely in this month. The grass is growing apace. Sheep and lambs are now uh, at grass with most of the lambing over, except, of course, for the hill men. Uh, but lowland flocks are well, well finished with lambing now. Milking cows are turned out, uh, beef cattle are out at grass, um, and we're looking forward now to the summer season uh, and all that means for us. This week's guest is a gentleman who I've tried to get on this programme for some time now because I know that he's got quite a remarkable story to tell. And when I tell you that the name J.R. Riley uh, is synonymous with Manx Agriculture, you will know exactly who I've come to speak to because that indeed is the case. Uh, the firm J.R. Riley, situated on Quine's Corner in a day gone by, was very, very much at the heart of Manx Agriculture. It's still there, of course. Though, of course, the emphasis now has changed somewhat. Uh, but I've come to talk to the man who I remember there at Quine's Corner, uh, who I, through my father, uh, used to do business with, uh, and so did many, many other Manx farmers as well. Raymond Riley, welcome to the farming programme. Thank you very much. <laughs> Raymond, I've tried to get to talk to you because I know you've got a remarkable story to tell, and I know that you've jotted down, um, as yet unpublished, your book of memoirs. Uh, I've been through it several times it's fascinating but you started life in Douglas a young boy growing up in Douglas and you lived at a place you called the cattle market well, I was born in Belmont Terrace and we moved to the cattle market which was quite a wonderful place for we lads to play in and the farmers used to come there with their horses and carts on a Friday and Saturday leave them do their business round Raleigh's Collet and Cowley's and the rest of that culture medicine while their wife went shopping <laughs> and to the pictures. Really? Oh. <laughs> and my father used to put the horses and carts in, the, harness them up, put them in the traps, put often enough the drunken farmer <laughs> in the back of the car, clout the horse on the backside and I would go home. <laughs> Well, well. So there was no drunk driving in those days. Uh, there was very few motor cars about. <laughs> we kept cows there and sold milk. At Quine's Corner? No, no. At the cattle, at market. The cattle market. Well, tell us, tell us where the cattle market was then. The cattle market was where the electricity have got their restore right along Lord Street. Mm. To the end of Just the at the corner of Ridgeway Street and Lord Street there, that, that area. That's right. And it... Uh, Stretch right to nearly to Quine's Corner and down into Queen Street. And we had two auctions a week. One was uh, on a Saturday, was furniture and anything else we could get our hands on. And on um, Tuesday was live and dead farm stock. So you said you had auctions. Who was the auctioneer? Well, my grandfather, J.T. Farragher. And, and am I right? Is, is that the name that's, that's still above the door in Queen Street? That's the name. And yeah. anybody driving along Lord Street can see it there? That's right. That's quite remarkable that survived in these changing times. Well, these cows, we used to milk them, sell the milk, and I, as a lad, we had fields out the quarter bridge, and every morning, spring and summer, after they were milked, they went out there, and they were brought back. Can you imagine trying to do it today? <laughs> Really? Mm-hmm. And, and so were the, it was quite a busy place, though, uh, in those days in, in Douglas. The, the harbour and, and round there was would be quite busy, wouldn't it? It would be. Well, Jones, the coal merchant, brought the fir his first shipment of coal in, and, in a sailing ship and sold it by the bag off the quay. Right. We used uh, to import drug at manures, and the, the sailing boat came from Ireland, pulled over on the South Quay side and the men used to carry it in their backs out of the hole 
across some of the warehouse because we really? were not allowed to keep fertilisers on the North Quay side. Why was that? Oh, some regulation the Douglas Corporation had. <laughs> they were at it then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a bit more about the cattle market and the men that, that came down there then. Would you just be a boy there then? Oh, when that I was, was only a boy. <clears throat> I went to Hanover Street School. Norman Christian, he bees. He was there, one or two other famous men around the, <laughs> or infamous. <laughs> and, uh, but it's a wonderful place. My grandfather, he didn't own it, he only rented it. It was owned by the Douglas Corporation, I believe, and it was taken over by them to make the electricity work. When you say it was a cattle market, was it just an open space or were there buildings on it? Uh, there was buildings on it, lofts, all sorts of things. Uh, I'm trying to think now, what else was there? there? And would the, would the auction be held in the open air in the pens or would there be a oh, ring? No, no the, 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 the Saturday auction was in the cattle market, mm. open there. Yeah. The Tuesday mart of the uh, Live and Dead farm site was down in, in Queen Street and we were able to walk from, we had a walkway from the cattle market down to Queen Street. Right. So how many cattle would, would you see there at a time? Oh, I can't remember now. Teens, twenties, so, more? Uh, everything. Cattle, right. sheep and pigs. And how, how, did you, how did you keep the area clean then with cattle in the market, swept up and... Oh, swept up. And we had horses and carts of our own. We had no lorries, no motor lorries in those days. So you remember the merchanting days before there was any any lorries? Well, before we had any lorries, anyhow. Right. Maybe Collets had a lorry. And we we used to load them up in the morning, and off we'd go, maybe out to your place. And we'd never see them again all day. By the time we got there, delivered, had his meal, and came <laughs> back, uh, fed and watered the horse, cleaned the harness, greased the axles. <laughs> it was time to go home. <laughs> uh, so what would what do you, would he be carrying out to the farms in, in those days then? Uh, bran, rolled oats, uh, calf meal, which we used to make ourselves from... Uh, we used to get far, 400 weight bags of linseed cake. For, was, what did you say? 400 weight bags of linseed cake. Big, big slabs of it. Do you know we're not allowed to lift anything more than 25 kilos today? Uh, well, there were men in those days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we used to take that the warehouse up through the uh, cubing machine we had, back up into the top loft, into a hopper, down through the grist of the other mill, and we can't mill. So you're milling your own your own we product. We're milling our own calf mill. How, and so, how was your mill driven then before the days of By electricity? By a six horsepower Crossley gas engine that is still there. Is it really? There's been several offers for it. I was offered, I think, two thousand pound from a firm across, and I said, no, if I get short of two thousand, <laughs> <laughs> I'll sell it. But it's still there. Has Fred Dibner had a look at it at all? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's pinched the the. Covers off the oiling, and all we're all brass. Somebody's been down there and taken. Oh, dear me! Yeah, oh. and 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 a gas engine, and, and this gas, drove the mill. Uh, that drove everything. The hoist and all. And so we we had a, a flywheel was about five feet high. You had to turn that backwards to get the compression on, and then forward to let it start up. It was a famous place for flywheels round about Quine's Corner oh, because there was a, an infamous... Uh, uh, At the electricity department. What happened there? I don't know. The, the, the flywheel came off the shaft up through the roof and landed in the Times building. <laughs> Dear me. Oh, there's some things went on in the key. <laughs> so was... tell me then, you, 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 you're you milling your own product and you, you imported linseed cake, etc. But did you use local produce as well to make up your rations there? Oh, I, oats, barley, wheat. From, 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 the from, from the farmers? Yes, right. And would they carry them in to you then? And, and... Yeah, no, we would bring it in, put it on the lofts, and I, with some of the men, would have to turn that twice a day to dry it there was no dryers in those days 
and uh, we, it was an awful job, and we had no, no face masks or anything like that. We used to even bail our own hay. Farmers, across the road we had a, another stable where farmers used to put their cows, horses and cows, and above it was a big loft, which was full of loose hay, and we had a baling machine there, hand baler. So just before you get to the baler now, you would buy the hay from the farmers and carry it in. He would bring it in. Right, and fork it up into the loft. In the loft, bale it, and sell it off. How, how, how were you baling it? I mean, balers weren't even... Well, it was a hand baler. It was a big thing. You you put the loose stuff in the this frame, turn the, the handle at the top, press down. And I, I think it was, must have been string. It wouldn't be wire then, no string. Tied it. It was only in bundles, not bales. Right, really. right. And we used to sell it to these chaps with their land doors. There used to there used to be a key a queue along the key to Coins Corner at lunchtime with the land doors wanting half a stone of oats, uh, a, fourteen pounds of chop. We used to ch- we had a chopper downstairs that used to chop the hay and all. <laughs> and we used to sell a chop. But you, you said, I remember a part of your book, you said he would either buy a stone or half a stone according to how successful he'd been in the day carrying people about. That's right, in the land of, yes. <laughs> so the That's horse, the, it depended on how well, the horse got fed or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they did for water. I never saw water. They had these nose bags, but I never saw them getting any water. Maybe there was a trough down the steam packet somewhere. <laughs> But it must have been a busy, a busy place then if you were doing all this, if you were doing the milling and mixing oh, and it selling it on. That's right. And how? And how then we had all our deliveries to do. Not much, well, a bit around town. There was horses and cars around town too. That's was true. it all horsepower then? Were, were there any well, there motor were vehicles? Motor, there were motor vehicles about. But a lot of horses still. A lot of horses. Wonderful sight too. It was to see the horses. So how did you go on then? I mean, you, you had to provide for this, this market every year. So did you go out onto the farms and, and, and buy the hay off the farmers, maybe before it was cut even? Oh, yes. Well, my, my grandfather used to be, because we'd been brought up on a farm, Balaconia Big, they at the farm. And uh, he was go and he trained father, because father, father was a Lancashire man. My father was a Lancashire man who used to come to the Isle of Man holidays stayed in Belmont Terrace at this boarding house that the family had and and they got to know my mother and eventually they got courting and got married and uh, then they, he came to live with the old man persuaded him to come over here and come into business and he had a rather difficult time because in those days a come over oh dear. in the agricultural oh dear. world. <laughs> he had a bad time to begin with father, but really, no, oh yes. But the farmers realised he was an honest man, right? And he, he then took up the auctioneering, right? When the grandfather, but but he came in uh, under the sort of the influence and the I suppose certain amount of protection of your grandfather. Oh yes, yes. He tell was, tell us a, a bit about it because auctioneers are usually characters. I know you are an auctioneer, but they're, they're usually characters, aren't they? And uh, uh, tell us a bit about your, your grandfather. Well, uh, your grandfather was the first magsman to get the freedom of the borough of Douglas. Was he really? I have the casket here. So he's in public life as well. He was an alderman. Really? Yeah. He was, he was the chairman of Douglas Town Commissioners, and they made him mayor for one day to inv- invest the first mayor of Douglas. Really, well, so well. my grandmother told me. Well, well, and this was the man who was and running he, the business. Yeah, there used to be a meeting. He had a little office across the door. They used to meet Willie Knox. He. And one or two others, I can't remember their names now, and they used to sort out uh, corporation business before they went to a council meeting. Oh, did they? <laughs> I'm sure they did. <laughs> I'm sure they did. <laughs> so this was the man who was running the business, and your father came over then and joined him. Joined it. Hmm. Just as a workman. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and then eventually my grandfather, two girls, was knocked down by a a porter's cart coming out of the town hall. 
this porter's cart had a big high load of boxes on. Didn't see him, knocked him over. Oh dear. And he was a small but heavy man. Right. Put him in bed and he'd, he was in bed for 12 months before he died. That, the death of your grandfather would be at the end of an era really, wouldn't it, it in that was. area? The police had asked, they decided what day he was going to be buried and they shut the street up there. Is that so? Yes, because the news were many people there. I know, because even in my time, I've I've heard, you know, about, about your grandfather yeah. and his, yeah. his uh, auctioneering and, and his merchanting there. Yeah. So your father then took to over the business? Over, took over the business, took over the auctioneering. I think he'd done a bit of auctioneering in my grandfather's time. I used to go with him in the trap. Really? Out to the farms and setting off early in the morning getting wet through before we ever started the auction. <laughs> to, to conduct a farm auction? A farm auction. What was a farm auction like in those days then? What, what would have come just live and dead stock? Live the same and as, dead, same as now. Same as now. I think we should make it clear that dead stock is the implements it of the was, farm, not, yes. <laughs> not, not, car the, not, not carcasses. <laughs> Oh, yes. uh, and and eventually you you took up auctioneering and, and you well, became a, father, an auctioneer. I, came, I was in the army and came back, and the first auction. You, you, you've skipped over that very quickly. You were in the army. Um, that's almost just a phrase. It was a big part of your life, wasn't it? Well, it took six six years and so many months. I was stupid. I went and volunteered. I was sent to the bank on the Monday morning after war was declared. My father sent me and. Uh, Captain Skate was opening a recruiting office now and then joined up. And when I went do, to do, do, uh, I'd like to ask you, do, do you regret that now? No, because I met some wonderful people. You made uh, relationships there that you would never make in civilian life. Really? Well, they saved your life, you may save theirs. And and did bits for them there, here and there. I know, because in, 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 the, in the notes that you've made in the book that I've been privileged to read, you mentioned a lot about you were at Alamein. I was, first of all, in France. Right. And it was a month after Dunkirk trying to get out. I eventually got out. We are on our way to Spain to give ourselves up because uh, either Jerry was bombing us or the British Navy was shelling us because they were knocking all the installations yeah. down the coast out. And we eventually got out. And the next thing I'm posted to the Western Desert. So I was four years out there. I think it's important to mention that because I'm sure those years that you spent in the forces um, influenced y you and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of made you the person, you know, that we've come to know. Um, and, and I think that was an important part. I suppose it was in most people's lives who, who were in was, the forces. It was, it was. I. When I was at Liverpool, had to sign on, get the king, king's shilling, I put a culture merchant. And immediately the major said, you're on reserved occupation, yes, yes. unless you want to fill another in. And I put chauffeur on it. Anyhow, years afterwards, when I was in Tobruk, there was all sorts of rumours went about, and there was one rumour went about, we just about chased Jerry out of... Africa, that anybody in agriculture was getting out. So I went in front of our brigadier, and I, it was those days, rank didn't matter. I only became a sergeant, so he was a brigadier, but it didn't matter. And I s said to him, I believe there's a room going around that, and I was in agriculture. So he sent this uh, wireless message after GHQ Cairo. After months gone by, there's a uh, while this message came back, this man is not as agriculture, he's a chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I was dragged in front of the OC then. And I, I said, I was never a chauffeur. I made <laughs> around my father and mother about now and again, but that was all. So uh, I had to explain to him what had happened. I suddenly realised this. Right. <laughs> and I'd done a job for the commander in chief of the Middle East forces, so. I got off of it, uh, and then they flew me home. Yeah, so you're back in the island, and, and you're back, back in the firm. The, back in the firm. Well, well. And the first auction I went to was strange enough for the fells of the Clips Farm. Right. Their granddaughter's married to our son now. Right, yes. And uh, I could hear the farmer say, who's the young fellow you've got now, Jack? <laughs> 
And he said, that's Raymond, because they'd forgotten me six years. Right, so right. So I had to make myself known to the Start monarchy. all over again. Start all over again. But you would go round on the farm auctions then, first of all with your father, and, 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 uh, and, and then eventually and then, you, you became an auctioneer in your own right. Yes, I had very, some wonderful experience as an auctioneer. Uh, there was one, and that was in your, written your day, on the Patrick Road for Marty Martin. Uh, Matty Brennan. Matty Brennan. Aye. And there was a chap from Derby offered, uh, came to me and he said, I've got permission from Matty to put a cow in. Now, it's not to go under £20. Now, this is final, Raymond. There's no argument. So... <laughs> And this was the first time I'd sold the livestock. I'd always sold the dead stuff and my father sold the livestock. This cow comes into the drink. <laughs> and I, which I'm entitled to, I started it up. And this was, I uh, found it, at £15. And I was £15 and £15. <laughs> and I went on and on. And father was shouting to me, whispering to me, the damn thing down and David <laughs> Cowan who's the clerk said lock it down Dear and they suddenly <laughs> realised what has happened and I kept on I thought what am I going to do and I think one farmer realised the mess I was in <laughs> and offered a pound more <laughs> and my game it went down quick <laughs> but I had a great help the war department came to me uh Crystals had turned this down. They couldn't handle it. It was too much with the Martin and all to look after. They wanted all the war department stuff and the Alaman sold. Really? Mm. Charge what you like, take on staff what you like, but get rid of it. And uh, I auctions for a fortnight. Going round, it helped me on my feet. One remarkable thing was, it... In Fort Street, they had the big warehouse, chock-a-block with these six-foot tables, some of them beautiful oak. And they had no idea how many of them were there. There must have been thousands of them. Anyhow, the day the auction came, crowds of people there, and I said to begin with, now then, we we'll sell them in lots of ten, but if somebody wants the lot, Never thinking for one more. I said, they can have the lot. So the bedding went on and on and on. And uh, Leslie Vondy was the last bidder. And I thought, I'll bet he's going to take the lot. And he said, I'll take the lot, Raymond. <laughs> oh, and the muffins round the Oh, boat. oh yes. Oh, my You're my. all waiting for them? No, oh, they're all waiting, but I'd said, yes, you could have yes. ten or the lot. So then they'd have to go to Leslie to buy. <laughs> yeah. So like, we didn't know the count. They'd be counted out as right. Leslie took them away. Now, you, you just mentioned in passing there a name that was well known in, in farming. So Davy Cowan. David Cowan. Oh, he, yeah. was a, he was a great character around yeah. the sales, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He, uh, was. he was with our firm from a boy. Was he really? Yes, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. And we had one or two arguments. I suppose I was a young man, I was the boss, and uh, David thought of me as a nipper, and uh, he suddenly decided to go to the Fowlerman Farmers. I broke my heart to see him run up the street that Saturday night, knowing he wasn't going to be there on the Monday. Yeah, dear. So, uh, yeah. I know, we yeah. survived. Yeah. And the relationship was all right after that. Ah, good. But he, he was a character, oh, and well known, da Davy Cowan. Mm. But uh, and and you mentioned as well the farmers that came into town, uh, you know, on 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 the Saturdays. It, it was it, it was a remarkable way. And I, do you think, Raymond, we we've lost that settled pattern of life? I think you, have, you know yeah. when Friday or it's mostly Saturday. <laughs> I remember in my boyhood days when when farmers came in and Boots's Corner was a oh, was a great place. Great place. <laughs> <laughs> I remember them having the uh, the twelfth uh, of November dues at Adelphi. At the Adelphi, yeah. the higher and there. <clears throat> mm. And and there would be quite a number of merchants operating sort well, of just round the area of, of where you you've were. You've only to think 
There was T.W. Kelly's, J.J. Cowley, Clayton Cranes, Carlton Cowley's and Riley's. Yes. And you knew if a farmer came in and priced a chip basket and he said, that's dear Raymond, off he'd go. <laughs> <laughs> to the round. And you know, if he came back to you, you were the cheapest. <laughs> you were the cheapest. <laughs> I would lots of fun. Most of most people. I would never like to have dealt with anybody else but farmers. I really? enjoyed the farmers. Really? Community, even though they ran me in debt sometimes. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, now, now, were you part of this system that? Uh, and I remember it uh, even in my time, in my time farming my own right, where you you bought what you needed from your merchant, and then. The harvest time, the back end, you you would square the account. You, Did well, were you able to run that system? Yes, we used to buy the oats, the wheat, Aye. the barley, the wool, the hay, the straw, the whole lot. Was it a good system? Yes, it worked. It worked in my grandfather's time, father's time, my time. Right. Oh yes, there was nothing wrong with it, but you never had a straightening up in the books. I mean, my, my accountants would say, you've had a jolly good year, Raymond. Yes, I said, but uh, if I want a thousand pound to buy a new car, I haven't got a thousand pound, I'll have to go at the bank. Mm. Mm. And farmers, I re recollect writing to farm well, putting a note on, dear so-so, it's a bit overdue, can you give me a bit of cash? Sometimes they'd give me something, sometimes they'd ignore it. <laughs> oh, dear. And then the next thing, you'd put something on the next month's account, a little bit stronger. Till it got, you wrote a letter and you said, we're not paid with seven. Right. Well, you'll have to do something yes. about it. Yes, Because the banks were on to us all the time. We were, mm. They said, you're acting as banks, but you're not charging interest. So uh, they would come and pay the lot and say, I'm never coming back here. I'll guarantee you within a month they'll be back. They were back, <laughs> round it up. Raymond, today, um, this may be only my own idea, but I've, I've got a notion that the word loyalty will eventually disappear out of our dictionary. Um, you've just mentioned the, the trading pattern that you had with the farmers. Was there loyalty in those days? Oh, yes. They, they dealt with nearly every merchant. They ran bills up with every merchant, <laughs> but they dealt with them. And there was always friendship. I mean, if I could go out, and I used to, when we put all these milking machines in after the war, I used to go around the farms servicing them. I would go to various farms to service the milking machine where I'd know I'd get a good feed to <laughs> <laughs> my lunch. And they made you awfully welcome. Aye. Awfully welcome. And that was another thing, wasn't it? There was genuine hospitality, wasn't Aye. there? Uh, nobody would go off the yard without a cup of tea. Uh, oh, no, no, you know. no, 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 And, and it, it would be an opportunity as well over the kitchen table to do a bit of business. And, yes, you always got an order. <laughs> More credit. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to say to me when I'd set the milking machine up after Gascoigne's had trained us all, you'll have a glass of milk, won't you, Raymond? <laughs> I'd say, no, thanks. I've never drank a pint of milk in my life. Have you not? I can't drink milk. I hate milk. But selling the milk machines. He, he had to sell a milk <laughs> machine. The first one I ever got over was the first Castletown show after the war. And it came on the passenger boat, an early passenger boat. Was, and I picked it up, went down. No idea how to put the darn thing together again. <laughs> and uh, one or two farmers that knew how to put them together showed me. <laughs> All right. I showed it, I think... Eight or ten of those portable machines. I right, think. yeah. Raymond, we, we, we must close this now, but I'm, I'm sure there must be an awful lot more that, 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 that you've got to share with oh, us. Oh, I could tell you. So, someday we, we may come we, back and, and continue it. There's another big episode which I don't know whether I'll be taken up for jail for saying this. <laughs> there was two grocery shops on the quay and they used to hang salt cod out. Right. And the dogs passing would lift the leg. <laughs> And the fishermen used to buy this. Yes, yes. Oh, God, they said wonderful taste. Oh, Ben, and not a bug could touch them. <laughs> <laughs> Raymond Riley, thank you very, very much for sharing those very wonderful memories Been and experiences. And someday we'll come back again. Thank you very much. But there we are, ladies and gentlemen. That's all we have time for this week. And this is John Kenyuk now signing off until next week's programme. <laughs>